Thank you everyone for coming tonight to this exercise for dogs and cats presentation hosted by the Ustan Institute for Animal Health Education. Uh, if you're new tonight, welcome. Uh, we're trying to do one educational event each month, so this is the event for January. Um, feel free to grab some food in the back and settle in. There are surveys that you've been handed at the beginning, if you can just complete those afterwards. Uh, and return them. If you've already been to an event before, you don't have to answer all of the excessive questions, just the top three. Um, but please answer the, at least the top three so to let us know how we're doing and if these events have been helpful. Um, bathrooms are right outside on the right hand. Um, and if, you, if that one's occupied, it's a single stall. So just go to the fourth floor. There's more stalls. Uh, some upcoming events next month of February. AMC is the official beneficiary of the Lunar New Year celebration. This is the year of the dog, so a portion of proceeds from participating retailers will go to AMC. We will also have a tent on the corner of 54th Street and Madison Ave where we'll be doing free canine dental health um, evaluations. And it will also be a doggy lounge. So if you want to bring your dog and stop by, say hello. Also shop around. Um, the proceeds go to AMC. So it would be great to see you on Saturday the 10th. Also March 2nd, we have a behaviorist coming, Dr. Jean DiNapoli, to talk about various topics on pet behavior. That's the number one thing that people have said they're interested in. So I really hope to see some of you there or tune in on our Facebook Live channel. Um, so just to note that these are being recorded and broadcast on Facebook and will be put on our website. So when it comes time for questions, please hold your questions till the end and then wait until the microphone is passed to you by someone so that we can capture your questions and people at home can hear them as well. Um, tonight we are pleased to have Dr. Barry Cherno with us. He is from the Integrative and Rehabilitative Medicine Department here. He's going to talk about a little bit of what they do here at AMC and also what you can do in your home. Uh, Dr. Richard Goldstein will be moderating for us. I am sad to say that this is his last event here with us. He is leaving us next month, which I am very sad about. He has been a great supporter of the Ustan Institute and various AMC things over the years. So we will miss his wonderful personality and his great intellect. So please give him a round of applause for his participation. Um, so this is his last event. So make it a good one, Richard. Here you go. <laughs> thank you, Jackie. And thank you so much for coming. Um, hopefully it's not my last event. I'm actually doing a lecture here in March for veterinarians. And hopefully I'll be invited back uh, to lecture for the Ustad Institute as well. So I am Richard Goldstein. I'm currently still the chief medical officer at the Animal Medical Center, um, which is the medical director of this wonderful hospital. And the people in the room, I think, all know the Animal Medical Center pretty well. But for the people out there uh, that are watching or, or will watch in the future, we are um, a very large, um, very busy, very good specialty hospital um, in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we see more cases than any other hospital in the world at a level of care, I believe, better than any, anywhere else in the world. Uh, last year, we had over 52,000 cases come through our doors. Um, and we have about 100 doctors and um, 100 technicians, 100 veterinary technicians, um, and about 450 total staff totally devoted to the care of these animals, um, as well as our additional missions as a nonprofit of um, clinical research um, and teaching. Uh, about half of our doctors are in teaching programs, interns and residents, learning to become specialists like the other 50 of us. Um, we also provide a lot of care uh, to special groups of people. Uh, we provide care to all working eye do uh, seeing, seeing eye dogs, uh, guide dogs, uh, completely at no charge. Um, and we have a lot of funds that we uh, allocate for other groups of people that need assistance in providing care for their pets. So it's a wonderful place to work. It's been a pleasure, Jackie, working. And the Houston Institute is, is, is one of the crown jewels of the Animal Medical Center. It's as, as part of our education mission, the Houston Institute takes upon itself a, a different mission of education, and really educating the public. Um, so you know, there's only so many vets out there, but there's a lot of people out there that come into, that, that have pets, that love animals, and, and are the, obviously the primary caregivers of, of their animals. And so the decision that we made a couple years ago to start um, really taking seriously education of the public around the world, and um, luckily we were able to do this through the Houston Institute, and hiring Jackie, who's pretty um, intelligent herself, um, and, 
and that's been wonderful. So, so we can reach people worldwide now and try and give them the best possible knowledge um, and education uh, and answer the questions on how to treat pets. So it's, it's lovely to do this. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm, and I'm very proud of, of everything that we, we do here. Today, I'm also very proud to have Barry uh, here. And, and you know, we try to pick topics for these things that are pertinent and that people can actually do at home. We're not, you know, we're not just talking about you know, the next cutting edge chemo drug, because that's really more for us to know and explain as, we, as needed. But um, these sessions that we really try to make very practical for people that can practice what we preach here in their own home. And, and, to, and today, we're talking about exercising pets. And, and we have. Um, one of, again, one of, I keep saying crown jewels, we can't have that many crown jewels, but you can have many crown jewels, I guess. One of our, our, our one, most wonderful departments is the, is the uh, Tina Flaherty um, Center for Rehabilitation and Integrative Medicine. And what we do in that uh, department is, is really um, supplement everything else that's done in the rest of the hospital. And I, and I think you're going to get a feel for that tonight. Um, it, it really rounds off the rest of the hospital. We can do fancy surgery, and we can do fancy neurology procedures and fancy medicine procedures. But the group of people that really put that all together and, 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 and help the well-being of the animal um, is, our, is our integrative medicine service. So Barry Cherno is one of our staff doctors. Our integrative medicine service has three doctors in it. Um, Lalani Alvarez is, is the head of the service, Barry Cherno. And then we have a resident in training to become a specialist um, who, whose name is Jen. And Barry is certified in rehabilitation as well as acupuncture. And today, the discussion is, is right up his alley uh, on exercising pets. So Barry, how did you get to be who you are at um, such a young age, <laughs> way, I should say? A little bit about myself. Um, as Dr. Goldstein said, I'm in the integrative and rehab department here at AMC. Uh, to go into what that is a little bit is it's a combination of Eastern and Western medicine, um, so a little bit of a holistic approach with acupuncture. Um, and then the rehabilitation port portion is sports medicine and physical therapy. Um, so we see all sorts of patients, such as post-operative patients, uh, any patients with a lameness, um, patients with arthritis, healthy patients that um, would like some conditioning, um, as well as uh, many others for acupuncture and, uh, again, coming from the Eastern Chinese medicine. And who, who does the treatments? How, how does it work? How does, so if I, need, I have an animal that needs rehabilitation treatment, I, I come to you first. How does it work after that? So we get people that come straight to us. We get referrals from, um, you know, your regular veterinarian might send you to us. Um, different departments in the hospital might send you to us. And the way that it'll work is you'll often start by seeing one of the doctors in the department, um, as, you know, we've spoken about. Uh, and then we would come up with a good plan, whether that's acupuncture uh, or formal rehabilitation or home exercises, as we'll go through a little bit today. Um, and we have some wonderful technicians that work for us uh, in our department. And they are uh, often the ones that will do some of those rehab exercises that um, you'll see on some of the videos that we see today. And so we, we all know, I think, on ourselves, whether or not we do it is a separate issue. But we know the importance of exercise in terms of being healthy, living longer, preventing disease. Is, is the same thing true in your mind in pets? Absolutely. Um, you know, you can see here, we've got a lot of different reasons why uh, exercise is so important. Just like us, to maintain a nice, healthy lifestyle. So um, maintaining good body weight, um, which will improve your ability to ambulate. Um, as far as quality of life, there have been many studies that have shown in people that exercise does actually improve quality of life. So we're able to transition that to our pets, who we obviously care so much about. Um, preventing cancer. Obesity has actually been shown to be um, to lead to chronic inflammation, which has been shown uh, actually to predispose individuals to cancer. Um, so that can actually be inferred that obesity can, you know, predispose some of our pets to cancer as well. So we want to try and avoid that as much as possible. Um, you know, another big thing that a lot of us probably deal with, especially with this weather, um, is we'll start to see a little bit of some behavioral changes with our pets that the energy is just getting a little bit too built up and they need a place to go ahead and expel that. So, you know, sometimes we'll see some chewing or, you know, ripping up of things, um, even sometimes a little bit of aggression. So we want to get them to exercise and, you know, get that energy out in a nice, safe way. Um, and as well as, you know, aiding in socialization. Um, so it's a good way to have our pets socialize with other pets, um, socialize with people, uh, and obedience as well. So uh, we, we actually do have three tre treadmills here in our um, integrative medicine and rehabilitation department, two water treadmills and one land treadmill. But most people at home don't use the treadmill for their pets. Yeah. Uh, you know, we think about elliptical, treadmill, rowing machines, maybe running in the park. 
What, what constitutes exercise for pets? So exercise is anything that requires physical effort. So as you said, things like jogging, running, swimming, you know, which we love to do with our pets, but also things like obedience, training. Um, you know, there are athletes out there that do fly ball and agility um, to even little things such as tug of war at home, rolling a ball around, um, and even the use of some puzzles that are uh, fun for them to play with too. And we're going to go through some of that. It's, it's, it's amazing how little it takes sometimes to enable the dog or even cat to exercise. You know, we just have to give them a chore and they'll do it sometimes for hours and hours and hours. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about cats specifically at the end. Cats, even cats can't <laughs> exercise. Uh, they just can't understand. And it they really. need it. <laughs> they, they do. They just can't know that that's what we want, right? They just have to <laughs> think that they thought of it themselves. Um, all right, so I think one of the most obvious examples of rehabilitation, you know, my daughter had knee surgery uh, this summer. Uh, she was in this ice thing for a few days, and then I think the next week she started to go um, weekly, and she's still going week weekly to um, physical therapy. That type of kind of tight connection to a surgical procedure is one of the easiest things, I think, for people to relate back physical therapy versus what we do. Absolutely. And like you said, you know, if you've ever had surgery yourself, often one of the first people to speak to you in the hospital is going to be the physical therapist. Um, so just as in, uh, you know, in human medicine, post-operative care is a big part of what we do here. Um, and I think a good way to kind of explain is to actually go through a case. Oh, cool. um, we yeah, a case. we happen to have I'm a case that. here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about a patient that we've seen here named Wyatt, who's a six-year-old golden doodle um, who tore his ACL, unfortunately just like Dr. Goldstein's daughter did. Um, and was he playing hockey as well? Or no? You know, I, I think he was playing ball outside when it happened. Um, so Wyatt had his knee surgically repaired here uh, at AMC, um, and it was a very successful surgery, and he did extremely well. Um, I will tell you, similar to your daughter, we also started rehab right away with him. Um, we started with uh, some modalities immediately after surgery, actually, um, with things such as ice and um, pain-relieving modalities such as laser and TENS. Um, and then working into some stretching and massage, which also is a little bit of an exercise. Um, and by the time he went home the next day, he was ready to start some of those home exercises. So we arranged a little bit of a home exercise plan for him, um, and then we saw him back at two weeks. So we actually, and this is obviously not everyone who's watching can come to Animal Medical Center, although it might be worth a trip, <laughs> but we actually do that as a routine part of surgery. That's bundled in with our knee surgeries is these two... Um, uh, events of, of rehabilitation therapy immediately post-operative and the next day. Uh, you don't have to ask for that. You don't have to pay for that. That's part of what we do because we believe so strongly in, in, in the fact that that's, that should be done after every surgery. And then uh, hopefully we convince them to come back and do the full course. Absolutely. Um, so you can see here Wyatt. He is walking very nicely, um, which is not always what Sorry, we see. Two weeks post -op? This is two weeks post-op, yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes we will have patients that come in almost non-weight-bearing. But as you can see in that video there, um, and I'll try and play it one more time for you, he's still quite lame on that right hind leg. Um, and you may be able to see on his way back, he's lost quite a bit of muscle. And when he was standing at the end, he was even to the point where he was non-weight-bearing. Um, so what we did and what we decided to do is that our goals were going to be to strengthen in his right hind leg, especially those quadricep muscles, um, similarly to in you know human medicine, um, and provide pain relieving modalities and exercises for him. So we got him right into rehab, um, and he enjoyed our underwater treadmill, as you can see here. Um, and we'll get another video for you in just a second. Um, there we go. And I think we all wish we had a little bit of peanut butter while we were at the gym, um, but that's a nice way that we're able to keep them motivated. You can see the peanut butter on the front of the treadmill there. Um, and one of the wonderful things about the use of the underwater treadmill is it takes concussion off of his joints. Um, so he's not having to hit that hard like we do on the land or, you know, even a land treadmill. Um, but at the same time, it also allows the resistance of the water for an increased uh, resistance and increased uh, effort for him to do some strengthening of those legs. And then we'll go through another exercise here. Um, so we've got him doing what we call a sit to stand. Um, and it's pretty, you know, pretty much what it sounds like. We're going to have him go from a sit to a stand into a sit again. Um, and we do that repetitively. And the reason we do that is similar to why you and I do a squat at the gym. We just unfortunately can't ask them to do squats. So we have him do the sit to stand, which will help strengthen up those hind leg muscles. And we'll also re-educate him how to sit into a normal position so he's less prone to hurt himself in the future. And then 12 weeks later, 
after our focused exercises, you can see no more signs of lameness, and he is walking nice and comfortably. Um, and at this point, we go ahead and transition him back to his uh, normal activity level. It's going to be a gradual transition. Um, so just like us, we don't go straight from surgery into running again. Um, but he was able to achieve his normal energy and activity level after that surgery. And just to contrast, um, you know, when I started working in veterinary medicine, I want to say 100 years ago, it was only 25 years ago, um, no one did this, right? We, we used to tell people six to 12 weeks of strict rest, don't move, don't risk messing up the surgery, and then they would have this horrendously under-conditioned, muscle-wasted leg, and they would have to start somehow building themselves back up with the stamina. So this is a totally different approach. It is, and actually some people will um, do what we call prehab as well. Um, so even before they go for surgery, we'll do some safe exercises with them um, to maintain that muscle mass before they go into surgery, which will hopefully also improve their uh, recuperation. So we're not starting at that level, as you said, where they have now completely lost all of their muscle and we're starting from zero. Um, so the profession is definitely starting to you know, um, look at this more, um, and it's becoming more and more popular, and more rehab centers are popping up. Um, and luckily, I work at one of the best ones in the country. And can you explain what that rug is with those little... Yeah, so this is something that, um, again, is kind of newer technology, which is fantastic. So as he walks across it, that um, mat there actually picks up the amount of weight he's bearing on each limb. It tells us his stride length and uh, multiple other factors, and that goes right into a computer system and allows us to objectively measure his gait, how much weight he's placing. Um, this way, as we continue to move through the rehab process, we're able to see with hard numbers our gains. So it's definitely one of the ways we're able to continue to measure uh, where we're at. And, that this, and this is a very, I mean, this is high tech, and you, you won't find this almost anywhere. But what it does is gives us objective data. Other than saying, oh, yeah, he looks look better or not better, it actually allows us to measure how normal his gait is, which is, which is a really nice thing to Absolutely. Have. Absolutely. Great. So post-op is kind of obvious, right? That's, that's uh, the, when we all know we have to go to, a, to physical therapy, and, we and if you're a dog, you should know you should come to physical therapy here at the Animal Medical Center. <laughs> what about more mundane things? So, you know, I've been on the couch for a few years. It's been a rough time. Uh, I want to start running. I have this dog. I want to start running with my dog. Um, or my dog, I believe, should start exercising because he or she's getting older and maybe a little overweight. How do I approach that? How do I? How should I start exercising with my dog? That's a great question. Um, so first and foremost, I always you know recommend um, going to your regular veterinarian to make sure that we've had a full physical exam um, that will allow you and your veterinarian to you know make sure that exercise is appropriate. And I will say that exercise is appropriate for almost every single patient. We just want to make sure we're doing the correct exercises and we're doing it safely. Um, so by seeing your regular veterinarian, we can make sure that we're aware of the risk factors um, and you know are, are going to go ahead and approach this in, in a safe manner. Um, you know, things that you're going to have to take into consideration is age of your pet. Um, so some older patients may be having diff different health statuses, um, you know, arthritis and those sorts of things. Um, breed can definitely play a role. We have some of those um, patients that just due to their breed may have a little bit more difficulty breathing um, with some exercises or their conformation might be different. So we may need to approach different, you know, exercises in different manners. Um, as I said, health statuses. So everything from their endocrine status to uh, their weight status, as you mentioned, are things that you know we definitely need to take into consideration. And I think the breed thing—I just want to stress that people, you know, not every dog is meant to run marathons. Um, some love it, and some, you know, it's dangerous for them. So you, you have to, you know, have to put yourself in your dog's paws for a minute and and think of it. You know, some dogs will run until they literally fall over um, because you're with them. Uh, but not every dog is adapted to every type of running. So if you want to be a real runner and run, run with a real dog, English Bulldog is probably not the dog for you. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, a couple of additional things to More take. Fans. No, yeah. And then, you know, we definitely see quite of those in the city of, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing this safely. And with Bulldogs, there are certainly ways to go ahead and exercise them, but running outside on a hot summer day, probably not one of the best. Um, so, you know, with that being said, we want to take safety into consideration. Um, so you all have a little uh, uh, handout here uh, that was given to you. And um, just like you and I going for a run, we're probably not going to walk out of our door and run a marathon. Um, so we want to make sure that just like you and I, we're doing a good warm up and cool down. Okay. Um, so we've made little handouts for you guys that go over exactly what that entails um, to be getting ready, warming up with a nice 
10, 15 minute leisurely stroll and a walk, um, and then moving up into about a five, 10 minute trot before we go into that run full out exercise where we're running in the park after the ball for an hour or whatever it is. Want to make sure that we're warming them up for that, make sure their muscles are ready for that sort of thing. Um, And then following that, we want to do a nice cool down. Okay, so cool down in another nice, you know, 10, 15 minute walk, followed by a little bit of stretching and massage. And on the back of that, Uh, handout, you'll see some uh, instructions for that stretching and massage there. Um, So we want to make sure that we're stretching all of their muscles, so their front limbs and their back limbs, um, and then making sure that we're massaging their tight muscles so they're nice and comfortable and ready to go again the next day. Yeah, and not, you know, and not really sore the next day. So, you know, if if, if someone out there is a real runner and then all of a sudden you get a new dog, that dog probably is not ready to run 20 miles. You know, they have to work up slowly just just like we do. Absolutely. We want to continue to make sure while they're exercising that we're watching for overexertion. Um, you know, a lot of people are similar in the week we call weekend warriors um, where they're kind of sitting on the couch or going to work all day. You know, sometimes our pets are going for two to three walks a day. But then on the weekend, we're going to the park or we're going hiking or whatever it is. Um, so we want to make sure we're watching for overexertion. So signs such as limping or excessive panting with the tongue hanging out. Um, you know, or, um, you know, not wanting to continue to move. They'll start to lay down and not want to move around too much. So we don't want to push them past their comfort zone either. Um, And with that being said, we also have to look at the temperature a little bit about, you know, something that we've, a few of us have discussed already, you know, on excessively hot days or excessively cold days. We want to make sure that we're taking the correct uh, measures to prevent any injury. Um, And then we want to also consider the surface that we're exercising in. Uh, repetitive exercise on concrete is obviously going to be a little bit tougher on the joints rather than if we're running on some sand or grass or soil, um, which is going to be a little bit easier, have a little bit more give, uh, and be better for our pet's joints. Any special dietary considerations? Do they, do they need protein shakes or...? Yeah, so diet is really important, and it's another thing that I definitely recommend speaking with your veterinarian about because we want to make sure that they're, you know, uh, that they're getting the correct carbohydrates and proteins and fat and everything in their diet, um, as well as vitamins and minerals, um, to allow them to exercise in a safe manner. And different types of exercise actually require different types of uh, diets, so we want to make sure that they're getting the right thing. Also, making sure that they're getting the right amount, so we don't want them to be overweight, so we want to make sure that they're getting the right portion size. Um, So that's another thing that we want to definitely keep track of. Um, And then besides that, joint supplementation as well. I like to start um, a little bit early on joint supplementation, especially for a patient that's going to be running and, you know, exercising quite a bit. Um, And you can see a few of the ones that we use here at uh, Animal Medical Center. Um, The bottom right there is Nordic Naturals Omega-3 fatty acids, so a fish oil that a lot of people actually take so why aren't we giving those to our pets? You know, we want to uh, make sure that we're protecting their joints and keeping down inflammation. Um, Movoflex, which is another joint supplement that has multiple different things, such as boswellia um, and uh, hyaluronic acid uh, and uh, eggshell membrane and a few others. Um, and then we've got Adequan, which is, you know, kind of moving to that next level um, where it's actually an injectable joint supplement um, that we use quite often and, uh, you know, we see very good results with that. Yeah, one of the things that's always um, I always like to think about is a lot of the a lot of the research that's done on exercise in dogs is actually done on sled dogs in Alaska at the Iditarod. So your little Chihuahua walking on you know in Central Park is actually benefiting from what we've learned from Huskies that are you know running for days and days and days and days. But that's kind of the extreme exercise, and then we can kind of scale back from there and see what kind of normal dogs need. Absolutely, and I can't stress enough the importance of portion size um, because, you know, with obesity, it's going to cause more load on our joints and, you know, uh, improve the progress of uh, arthritis, which we certainly want to delay as much as possible. Um, So we want to, you know, maintain nice lean body weights on our patients. So other than a little bit of obesity... um how, how else do I know if my dog is not, or cat, not getting enough exercise? Um, so there are, you know, a few signs. So as we said, uh, weight gain, we talked a little bit about some of the, um, you know, uh, behavior that we might see. So destroying things in the house, uh, doing what, you know, some call the zooms, running circles and circles and circles, um, that they just need to get a little bit uh, of energy out. Um, so some hyperactivity, um, you know, 
we can sometimes see muscle loss, as you mentioned before, um, as well, and just, you know, a harder time getting up and moving around um, can also be signs of not getting enough exercise, that they're not maintaining that ability. Um, and there are actually some activity monitors, just like you and I use, like a Fitbit, um, that there are, are companies out there that um, have made these for our pets, so we're able to log in um, and see just how much activity they're getting. You can see how much activity they're getting at home, uh, sometimes even if you're not home, running around the house a little bit. Um, and that'll also give you a good idea of, you know, am I doing maybe too much on the weekends? Um, and do I need to maybe increase during the week a little bit so I'm not getting to that point where they get overexerted on the weekends? Um, so that'll help us, you know, not only let us know if we're getting enough, but if we're getting too much at certain times. Um, so if, you know, our pets are sore or something like that, we can look back at those results and say, okay, maybe they were doing a little bit too much that day. But the classic sign is obesity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about one of our patients well, here. I wish we had a case of an obesity. It would be really, <laughs> uh, it'd be really handy. And what do you know? Um, we do. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about Bailey, um, who is a nine-year-old dog um, who is suffering from weakness in the hind end um, and reluctance to stand for a long period of time. Um, another, you know, issue that she's having that you might notice at home is she's actually having difficulty getting in the position to defecate and urinate because she's just got so much weight that it's hard for her to hold that position. Um, so she was having all of these problems, and a big reason that these problems were occurring was because of her obesity. Um, so I'll show you a little bit about Bailey here. This is her initial consultation. Um, and as you can see, she's got a little bit of extra weight on her there. So we like to score, you know, our um, cats and dogs out of a nine-point scale when it comes to their weight. Um, one being, you know, completely emaciated, and nine being um, obese. Uh, and we like to keep our patients at about a four to five. Okay, so. I like to keep them just at the point where people are telling you your dog is really skinny um, because that tells me that they are not having too much of that load on their joints. And you can see we have handed out uh, our second handout here, which is Purina's body condition scoring system. So uh, on one side, we've got the cat, and the other side, we've got a dog. Um, and that will tell you exactly you know, how uh, we grade those patients here. Um, but a quick you know, kind of method, because many people will say, OK, you've told me that my my dog or cat is overweight, but how much should they lose? That's a really difficult question because often if they need to lose weight, they also need to build some muscle. So I, it's hard to give a number sometimes. So a way that was once taught to me, and I'm going to show you guys today, um, is by using our hands. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and feel over um, the ribs of our pets, and then we want to take our hand and make a fist. And if you feel over the knuckles of your hand, that if you feel the ribs feel like that, then that's going to say we're a little bit too skinny there, okay? But if you feel over your fingers, where you can feel just a little bit of a divot there, that's exactly where we want them. And now if you go ahead and open your hand, and you push along the inside there to try and feel those knuckles, you have to push a little bit down there, and that's when you're getting to that overweight period, okay? So we've all seen Bailey here, and we'll take one more look at her if we can, okay? She's going to walk right on by, and this will give us a good view of her. And now looking at your body condition score, you know, you can go ahead and decide for yourself where you think she is. Um, but I'll tell you where we thought she was, was we thought she was between about an 8 and a 9. So she's really high up on there. Um, on our physical exam, she, we could not feel her ribs when we were trying to. Um, and later on, we, go, we went ahead and asked her to sit and go into a stand, and you can see she couldn't do it. It took her a lot of effort to get into that standing position. Yeah, so you can imagine why she was having that difficulty getting into those positions to urinate and defecate. It was just a little bit too much for her. So what we did is we went ahead and got her into rehab as well, um, and she was one of our lucky ones to use the underwater treadmill as well. Um, so just like us at the gym, she is doing that you know, good work out there, but again, using the buoyancy um, to keep that load off of the joints because as she is overweight, that's going to be more load on those joints. She's already dealing with a little bit of arthritis, so we wanted to avoid you know, creating more pain there. 
And then just like you and I, we also did some core work. Unfortunately, we didn't have exercise, uh, some pictures of Bailey, so we got our cue to stand in here. Um, and what he's doing here is uh, he's balancing on that physio ball there, okay? Um, so it's an unsteady surface, and it's very similar to you and I doing a plank at the gym, so a nice core exercise there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's like doing a sit-up or a plank for, uh, for them. We just can't ask them to do that again. So a few months after these targeted exercises, a good diet, acupuncture, um, and home exercises, you can see she's lost quite a bit of weight there. Actually, she's lost about 15 pounds um, since starting, yeah, since starting rehab. Um, and I'll tell you, sitting down and standing up has definitely gotten much easier for her. Um, at that time, she was able to hold the position to urinate and defecate a little bit, and her owners reported that her quality of life, her happiness has improved so much, so we were really happy for them. I think she's still got maybe just a little bit to go, but you know we're definitely trending in the right direction. So Barry, for, for the majority of the people out there who can't come to the Animal Medical Center because they just live too far, can this be done at home? It can. So there's a lot of different um, exercises that can be done at home. Um, you know, starting with things like just as simple as walking um, to moving on to some of those targeted exercises that we saw before, such as planking on uneven surfaces um, and doing those sit-to-stands um, and, you know, multiple other different exercises. Again, it's, you know, ideal to see a regular veterinarian before um, because if she had knee problems or if she had elbow problems, some of those might not be the correct exercise for her um, so you know but there absolutely are some home exercises that they can be doing that too can be prescribed by the veterinarian absolutely absolutely so you know while it would be ideal to come in for physical rehab with us um, there's still a lot of home exercises to do I always tell my patients actually that it's similar to going to the gym with a personal trainer so you don't typically go to the personal trainer every single day um, so we tend to be considered the personal trainer so we like to see them about once a week but we still have to do the work on our own right so we're going to the gym on our own they should be doing their exercises at home as well. So all of our patients go home with a good home exercise plan targeted and tailored just for them. Great. I bet you if we took a poll of people in this room or in any room, they would say that cats cannot be made to exercise. Yeah. Cats do what they want. Absolutely. You know, dogs have owners, cats have staff. Yeah. So... <laughs> So how do we make cats exercise? Yeah, well, we certainly can't forget about our, our feline friends. Um, and there's multiple different ways to make them exercise, um, you know, and I think a, a big way is uh, via playtime, okay? As you said, with our dogs, we're often able to entice them with a little treat or peanut butter, as you saw, but we're not going to have very good luck of putting a little peanut butter on the front of that treadmill and asking them to get into that water treadmill and see how they go. Trust me, I've tried, and my arms weren't happy after the scratches. Um, so, you know, we do get them to do exercise, but again, it's on their own terms very often, um, and it's getting them to do it via play. Um, and we happen to have a case that we can talk about, um, and this is Wilma. Uh, Wilma was unfortunately found as a stray with a broken leg um, and rescued by the Animal Medical Center. Uh, and her leg was repaired, but unfortunately, uh, you know, she had a lot of muscle atrophy and at the time wasn't really even bearing weight uh, on her limbs. So we started with some stretching and um, those sorts of exercises and slowly moved her up. Um, and some of these, so you can see some of our home exercises here. Um, so again, using the play atmosphere um, on the left there is we're using a laser pointer to get her to do some active stretching. So she's stretching both of those back legs that way as high as she can, um, as well as bearing a little bit of extra weight, which is, you know, a, another hind limb exercise. So as she bears more weight on those legs, it's more work for those legs and that's muscle for those legs. Um, and then to the right there, you can see that's a, what we call a three-legged stand. Uh, we've got her distracted by a little bit of food there. She luckily is a, a big food girl there. Um, and we're doing a three-legged stand, so we're taking weight off one limb and forcing it to, uh, onto that other side, so encouraging her to bear more weight onto that limb. And what that's going to do is, again, that's going to strengthen that limb and encourage her to bear weight. So while she wasn't exactly thrilled about bearing weight in the beginning, if you gave her a little bit of food and lifted up her other leg, she would bear weight just fine, and she eventually started to build up some, some muscle there. Um, and then we're able to get her to play a little bit, and you could see some more of that elevated standing here, um, and any sorts of things such as laser pointers or feather toys or all different sorts of things uh, will get her to move around and play a little bit. 
And then we've also gotten her after a little bit of time to where she can run and move around without any issues. Um, and you can see here she's doing some circles. So, you know, that'll force some extra weight into that middle leg that she's um, turning on. So that's another strengthening, um, as well as just getting her moving around and, you know, playing and being happy rather than maybe just kind of laying in her cat tree, which is more of what her favorite things are to do rather than playing and moving. So after time, she is now a happy uh, kitty and, you know, able to bear weight. She, her musculature has improved. Um, she's stayed nice and lean, which is really important, especially because now she's got some orthopedic problems. Um, and she's driving her little puppy brother crazy. Um, so. That's great. And that, so obese cats can start that way as well. Absolutely. So, you know, the biggest thing is getting them up and moving. Um, as we said, a lot of cats love to just lounge around, and who doesn't? Um, but, you know, using playtime, using feeding time, and those sorts of things can be really great ways to, you know, get them to exercise. And this is going to be done all indoors, of course. Absolutely. What about dogs indoors? Yeah, so obviously we've been experiencing quite a bit of cold weather here. So there are some options for doing, uh, doing some exercises indoors. So things such as obedience training, which might not be considered exercise by some, but if you think about it, as we went through earlier, the sit to stand that we did uh, is a great hind limb strengthening exercise. Um, asking them to go from a stand up to a lay down and back into a stand up is a great forelimb exercise. So for those front legs, um, asking them to do what some consider called a place, so where they stand on a predetermined surface. If that's an uneven surface, that's that core planking exercise that we were talking about. Um, even teaching them to do that beg or sit pretty that we often see in the movies is a really great core exercise for them as well. Um, you know, puzzles can be used uh, that either encourage them to use their front legs to paw at them um, or that they have to move around with their nose a little bit to follow around. Um, that'll get them up and moving and, you know, rather than just laying on their bed throughout the day. Um, hide and seek is another great one. So either putting their toys in different places or, you know, hiding little bits of food around the house can be, you know, a good way to get them up and moving. Um, they actually make special cat feeders um, that are designed uh, to bring them back to their natural instinct of hunting. Um, and that's going to get them moving around the house a little bit more, um, moving their uh, food around a little bit more. Um, so that'll ho hopefully help with, uh, you know, increasing their movement and decreasing calories. Um, and then just playtime, as we mentioned. So things like tug of war that you can see here is a good exercise um, for, you know, certain patients, um, as well as rolling a ball or playing fetch um, or those sorts of things can also be a really fantastic way to exercise. Great. So we've covered post-op, dogs, cats, Anything else, or should we ask them for, if they have any questions? You know, I think uh, I think we've gone through a lot. You know, I think we can open it up to questions. I do want to um, just give you guys our information here again. Uh, if you do want to reach out to us, um, you can find us at the rehab team at amcny.org, um, and that's uh, checked by everybody in the department. So you'll be able to that's the contact. Email that's the email address, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, as uh, as Dr. Goldstein said, uh, our team is made up of uh, Dr. Alvarez, who is our department department head uh, who is nice enough to give us the information that you see on uh, the uh, handout there, um, as well as myself and Dr. Repack, who is our resident. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we've got some really fantastic, um, well-trained technicians who uh, do a lot of our, um, a lot of our treatments too. Um, so they're going to be really, uh, you know, integral in our department there. Great. So we do have some time for questions. Yeah. Wonderful. So, so um, Jackie will come to you with the microphone and please feel free to ask anything. So what if you have a baby kitten that you have to quarantine and keep in a cage, say, for a month, possibly two months, um, so otherwise healthy in terms of walking ability or running ability, um, like how many times a day should you take them out to, because if there's another pet in the house that can't get whatever it has, you have to keep it in the cage. So how often... Uh, should you take it out to run around? So far, I've been doing it like twice a day. Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm glad that you actually said kitty because, you know, that's something that we need to take into consideration. A lot of our exercises um, is age. Um, so, you know, a lot of people really only consider our older pets um, for arthritis and those things. But some of our younger pets um, also have, you know, 
growth plates that are not completely closed yet and their bones are growing still. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing this safely and appropriately. So it's a really good question. Um, and obviously, as a, a kitten, probably has quite a bit of energy. Um, so, you know, multiple times a day is ideal, as you said, you know, two, three, four times a day, um, you know, kind of allowing them to, to choose and, you know, really keeping an eye on what they're telling us. Um, so if they're starting to seem a little bit tired, then maybe it's time to go ahead and give them a break. Um, so you can do multiple small amount of time uh, exercises um, and also making sure that we're using good surfacing for that. Um, so a lot of our exercises, as you may have noticed earlier, were on really good traction flooring. So that's going to pre prevent them from slipping and sliding out and splaying. Um, also, we want to make sure that it's not too firm. So number one, obviously, if they fall, but number two, to help you know prevent that concussion on those joints and those growth plates. So we want to make sure that we're taking all of that into consideration too. Um, so you know, it's, it's good to multiple times a day um, have her out and, and doing things. And then obviously it seems like she may have a little health concern going on. So making sure that we're cleaning up the area that she's in, um, even if we are bring, bringing her out of the crate at that time, this way we can bring our other pets in safely to that area again. Great. Yeah, out of the apartment if you can, that's you know a good way as well. That's great to have a cat question. You know, we all, we just get, oh, it's nice to have a cat question. <laughs> sure. So what if you have a cat who doesn't have a medical concern, like I wouldn't be bringing my cat here for surgery. Do you offer rehab and exercise just for cats? Like if I say, oh, I'd like to bring my cat once a week, he needs a little more exercise. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. We have, we, we have rabbits, um, Reptile birds. birds. Yes. Um, we, we will yeah. see anything that you bring in pretty much. Um, so cats are, are one of our favorite, actually, um, because it's a challenge sometimes. And, you know, again, you can ask dogs and, you know, to do certain things, but really encouraging a cat to do certain things can be real fun. Um, so, you know, it is a good time. And, you know, getting on that sort of thing early, as you've said, is, is, is a really good idea. Um, even if they're starting to get a little bit overweight, we want to prevent that. Um, as we went over some of the risks of, you know, leading, you know, that can lead to when we're overweight, um, we want to prevent that sort of thing. So absolutely, we can do some of those. And you know, I definitely encourage those home exercises as well. Um, so really ramping up playtime. If they're really big into food, which unfortunately a lot of ours are, and that's what leads them to be obese, is you know making that playtime for them as well. So whether that's in one of those feeders that they really have to bat around um, to get the food out of and... Exactly. Yeah, the ball, they make some that are shaped like mice. Um, they make all different sorts of them. Um, and, you know, also having bowls in different areas of the house. So maybe they'll get a little in one, but they still have to move to that next room to get to the next one. And then putting them, you know, on something elevated so they have to jump to get to another one. Um, so this way we're keeping them moving. Um, they just don't know that we're keeping them moving. But to answer your question, we'd absolutely love to see all cats, even if they don't have any health or problems already. We like to do conditioning programs. So we definitely have quite a few that healthy patients that we see just to have them conditioning. Um, some are working dogs, other are not. We just want to keep them as comfortable as possible and as mobile as possible and as happy as possible. Yeah? Yes. What I do with my cats is I throw greenies all over the place. And they go crazy. Oh, um, and they go crazy because they love the greenies. So it gives them exercise besides the laser, which they climb walls. Exactly. Yeah. Using those. Yeah, luckily cats don't need too much room. So, you know, you're doing that, moving it around. And even if they're doing circles, they're moving around. So, you know. As long absolutely. as they find all the greenies at the end. That's, yeah. that's, that's what matters. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Our cat, you're getting a lot of cat questions. <laughs> Our cat is a, um, it was uh, 10 years old and slight, I believe slightly overweight. Um, we're giving him wet food, high quality wet food, because we heard the moisture is good for their, I guess, the kidneys, um, and the dry food just a little bit in the morning. Um, if we were to cut back, like, I mean, how do you recommend cutting back on, uh, like, working out the cutting back of the food? I mean, Right. To get her to lose weight. To get Absolutely. To lose weight. So this is definitely a, a you know more of an individual um, patient question because. It, it would depend a little bit upon her weight. And then what we would do is we'd actually do a calculation, which would allow us to know exactly what her portion size would be. A lot of bagged foods actually will overfeed a little bit on their feeding instructions. Um, you know, those kind of big, plumpy cats and dogs look like they're happy and, you know, are the cute ones. But, you know, so often, sometimes we're overfeeding without knowing or meaning that we're over, meaning to overfeed. Um, so definitely working with your veterinarian to make sure that we're doing the correct portion size. Um, even sometimes if we are a little bit overweight, feeding a little bit under what it should 
should be to go ahead to go ahead and help with that weight loss. And then adding in that additional exercise would be really helpful as well. So just like us, you know, dieting is really fantastic, but the best way that we can help ourselves lose weight is to diet and exercise. So that combination would be most ideal. Um, so it's not necessarily always about what it is we're feeding, but oftentimes it's about the portion size of what we're feeding. Um, and sometimes we're able to feed a little bit more of something healthier um, and a little bit less of something that is less healthy, but they're still able to get that. So it's not necessarily that you have to stop the wet food or stop the dry food if uh, she prefers one or the other. You know, it's just making sure that we've got that portion size correct. And from the, from the kidney standpoint, um, it, it is, a, it is a, a nice idea to feed wet food as well. And rule of thumb generally is that half of the total food, if, the, if half the total food is wet food, then you're getting that added amount of moisture and, and, and helping your kidneys stay happy. So it, you, you can play with it and you can decrease both or, or increase both. But the ideal recommendation is that, that half of her total food is the wet food. Yeah. I think there was one more over there first. <laughs> Um, I have an overweight dog at home. A dog question. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and I was wondering, how long should a typical training session be to do this, the stand from the lie down and the stand from the sit and those types of exercises? How long should a typical training session run for about in a day? Really fantastic question. And so that's something that is a little bit similar to us going to the gym as well. So if we go to the gym and you and I go and, you know, Take me, for example, who hasn't been to the gym in quite a while, and I go and I try and do a full hour workout. Well, I'm going to be. Words, those squats, <laughs> yeah, I know. I should be. You know, my job is exercising a little bit. Um, but, you know. It, it might be a little bit difficult at first, so we're going to do what we call a gradual increase, okay? Um, so if we're just starting out, you know, a training session might only be five or ten minutes, um, but eventually over time we're going to hope to move that up to, you know, maybe an hour, and it doesn't necessarily mean that for that full hour we're going to be doing intensive exercises. There may be stretching in there. They may, there may be massage in there. There may be some, you know, so, some good breaks in there, just like, again, at the gym, we don't go set, set to set. You know, we do some nice breaks in between. Um, so... It's something that we're going to gradually build up, and we're going to sometimes allow them to tell us when they're tired or if they need to keep going. But at the same time, we don't want to overdo it either. So I absolutely. Think we have time for one more question. Yes. I have one cat who's underweight. She's seven. He's seven or seven and a half pounds. How do I get him to gain weight? I feed him all the time. So gaining weight sometimes can be a little bit more difficult. Um, and, you know, that's something that, one, I definitely recommend going to your reg regular veterinarian to rule out any other, you know, metabolic or endocrine problems, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, we need to then, again, look at our portion size and look at our activity level because if they're not getting the correct portion size and they're actually doing more activity than, um, you know, what we're feeding for, you know, then maybe they're not getting enough nutrition. So, you know, it might be that. Their metabolism might be a little bit high. So um, there's multiple different ways you know, I think looking at that portion size comparatively to what they're doing throughout the day uh, is going to be the best way to, to go about yeah. that. And if you have multiple cats, it's sometimes hard, but the most important question to be able to answer for the veterinarian is how much is the cat eating? Because Absolutely. when we look at a cat that's losing weight or not gaining weight, there's a whole slew of reasons that they would do that when they're not eating, and there's, but there's totally different reasons to lose weight or not gain weight when they are eating. You know, a diabetic cat will eat all the time and still lose weight. So how much the cat is actually eating, which is hard in a multi-cat household, I get that, but how much the cat is actually eating is a key inf piece of information for the veterinarian to know to figure out which way to go. The diseases of, of absorption, where they're eating but not absorbing the calories, or the, the reasons that they don't want to eat because they're sick. Okay, I, I'm, okay, what, okay, good, good, good. Okay, well, now one more question for real. Hi. Um, so I have a dog. When he was about a year and a half, he was diagnosed with luxating patella. And I was told that as he gets older, there might be a chance I need to do sur like get him surgery. He's 10 now. He's and super cute. <laughs> thank you. And it's definitely getting more prominent where he's uh, lifting his uh, hind right leg all the time because that's where the luxating patella is. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you recommend where I can actually avoid the surgery perhaps? So that's a, that is a good question. It's something that we see quite commonly, especially in some of these small, cute breed dogs. Um, and it depends, actually, on the grade of luxation that we're seeing. Um, so we, we grade them out of four. Um, and unfortunately, grades three to four are out most to all of the time. So the patella is not in place. And for those who don't know what a patella is, it's the kneecap. Um, so you know that means that the kneecap is out of place all of the time um, to most of the time. And those, unfortunately, we're unable to 
you know, help with exercise, and those may require surgery. Now, some of those grade one to twos, you know, there are some targeted exercises um, that we're able to perform with them. It's a little bit difficult to say for sure that it's safe without doing that full exam to make sure nothing else is going on, but um, it definitely is something that we treat, you know, quite often those low-grade um, patellars uh, to try and delay or prevent the surgery as much as possible um, and try and, you know, maintain their comfort. And what we would do is we actually strengthen certain muscles around the kneecap to hold it in place more than um, when it's already falling out. Um, so to answer your question is, yes, there are certain exercises and ways to, um, to maintain the patella in place, um, but it depends on the, uh, the progression and the grade of the luxation. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, very much uh, absolutely. Uh, for, it's my for pleasure. doing this. And I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much. Um, it's, an, it's an effort to come here in the, in the wintertime, and many of you bring your animals, which is just wonderful. So again, thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. And for everybody that's joining us uh, via Facebook or, or is watching us later on, uh, thank, thank you as well. Um, our website is uh, amcny.org, um, and our, through our website you can find the USTAN Institute page, which has um, a lot of information for pet owners out there, also has a list of our events. We've had events all year, we're going to have events all this coming year. Uh, Jackie mentioned the next one, February 10th, the Lunar Year Celebration, which will be in Midtown somewhere uh, on, on February 10th, which will be a nice warm February day, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> So again, I'd like to thank you so much. Go to our website. If you have questions, you can continue to ask them on Facebook. Um, and uh, I look forward to a lot more information coming from the Houston Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.